Hey guys, welcome back to Home Built, and this week we are delving into a bunch of issues on the Al Ferrari. Alright guys, welcome back, and uh, those who missed it, the Al Ferrari did survive. It, um, it was a very close call, I did snap a timing belt four-fifths of the way through, and five millimetres saved my bacon, and uh, thank you very much to all of you who, uh, who reached out with your support. Um, it was a very low and then a very high of uh, finding that it actually survived. And uh, um, if you missed it, I'll put a link up above so you can catch up and uh, just sort of see what happened. And uh, like always, subscribe, um, hit that notification bell and, uh, and comments and stuff. It all really helps the channel out. I did make it to the Festival of Speed in Canberra. It was a fantastic event. Very Thank you very much to the organizers for uh, putting it on. First time running and uh, it was such a great way to uh, get to see all these cars. Not just being a static car show, it was two days, but having the, the track, which was a very small tight track, but you still got to see and hear and be right next to a whole bunch of amazing cars, F40s on track, Formula One cars, V8 supercars, every exotic you can think of uh, driving down the track and actually getting to see see them moving and hear them and all that sort of stuff, I think was really good. All the spectators I talked to seemed to really love it and uh, yeah, I found it to be a fantastic show. Um, definitely put it on your list for next year. The Al Ferrari. It was uh, quite a hit at the show. Uh, I talked to a bunch of you. Thank you very much for uh, coming up and saying hi. And uh, it did raise a few issues with the car because I actually managed to get it out on the track. And uh, it's the first time I've really properly gotten to drive it. And it brought up a few glaring issues that we currently have. Uh, overheating, with the bonnet closed, I did manage to start it, sit at idle in the, um, in the paddock for 10 or 15 minutes, waiting for my go, and then do sort of three laps of the track. Getting on it, I managed to get on the, uh, on the power and, uh, and sort of uh, and have the first little bit of a go on it. Um, I was not pushing it in any way, just sort of gave it a little bit of a squirt up the main straight is about all I did. Um, the overheating issue, it, by the time I got off the track again and then got all the way back around to um, where I parked it, I had the sand, fan set up to turn on about 83 degrees. It got up to about 97 degrees when I turned it off, so it was creeping up. So it is still overheating, but not 
by a lot. Um, it is far too loud. It is extremely loud. The uh, partition in the exhaust doesn't really seem to have changed the exhaust night much at all. Um, to me, it sounds basically the same as it did before. I don't think that made a big difference, but um, it's still far too loud. Uh, and the big glaring issue that I never uh, realized until I drove it is the steering. The steering is currently dangerously slow. So um, on the track at uh, Festival Speed, there's a little chicane where in most cars you would be doing, uh, you know, doing that to go through the chicane. In the Alfa Ferrari, I was like this, and then, oh, trying to get it back to the other way. The steering is far too slow. Now I had a bunch of comments about the slow steering in the last video. There are steering quickeners you can get. So basically there's like a, a little gearbox that goes in the line of the steering shaft that uh, can either one and a half to one or two to one ratio to actually uh, change the ratio. The trouble is that they're about eight inches long and I don't have that room to put that anywhere in the system. What I have already done is I went to uh, see my mate Tim at Zoo Autocraft and he actually had a couple of the, uh, uh, the shorter steering arm. This bolts on sort of, if you imagine, this is basically central to the hub, and this is where your tie rod end goes in, and that's what steers the car. There are shorter ones available, cast proper uh, shorter ones, uh, that I've now changed onto the car, but which I think has probably helped a bit, but not enough. Um, after looking into it, Basically, because I changed the car from a steering box to a steering rack, they don't, um, they, they aren't designed to work together. And moving it around the shop, yeah, the steering works. You don't really notice until you're actually driving it how it actually properly performs. And uh, looking at the steering rack, it actually turns three and a half turns lock to lock. So that's a lot. Um, I have looked for other steering racks that will potentially work and I have a Toyota Yaris steering rack that I just got from a wrecker that uh, is on its way but I don't have it yet. So um, the steering is something we're gonna wait on. First things first today, I think we're gonna get it up in the air, get the exhaust off and we'll do something about that noise. Exhaust is off and uh, my next thing is to quieten down a bit. I actually went and got myself a couple of these uh, mufflers there. Uh, still relatively straight through, but uh, hopefully uh, this will do a little bit to quieten down a bit more than what it currently is. So uh, what I need to do, because I don't want this to move, I need to weld in some braces into it before I start cutting and uh, I've marked out where I, I can fit these mufflers in. I know that I've got enough room in the back, uh, underneath the back seat, so I'm gonna sit the mufflers sort of something along those lines there, either side. So here you can see, I'm just using a few pieces of scrap I've had lying around the shop to brace the exhaust in multiple directions so that it stays where I want it to. And I'm using my cable tie trick by putting a cable tie and sort of spinning it around the exhaust. I use that to mark out my line to get a nice square cut. And I trim it to shape and just fit the muffler. And I realized that my bracing was getting in the way, so I have to trim that out to uh, get a nice fit. And I start by tacking it all in with a MIG first. And then I go around and weld it in properly. Then it's the same again on the other side, making sure I get them looking reasonably even. All right, well, so we have both of the new mufflers on and completely welded up. Um, I'm gonna let it cool down completely before I take the bracing off uh, to try and avoid as much of sort of the warping as I can. Um, 
it probably will still move and I may have to adjust the exhaust tips to make sort of fit perfectly in the body line later, but we'll, uh, we'll run with it for now and see how it goes. So while we're waiting for it to cool down, we're gonna start tackling my overheating issues. All right, so currently the fans that I've been running in the Alpha have been uh, these two nine inch fans and uh, they're just not up to snuff. They flow about 591 CFM each and uh, I thought it was time to upgrade to one single. So I got this fan, it's a Maradine 14 inch fan and this one fan flows almost double what both of those fans flow. This flows 2135 CFM um, it's not all about CFM, but ultimately this will suck through twice as much. So first of all, we need to make sure it fits in the engine bay. All right, it fits. Uh, I have enough space for where this motor is, and this sits nicely, um, as I was hoping, just sort of underneath my uh, radiator pipes. So I don't have to modify any of that. I do, however, have to modify the shroud because that one no longer fits. So let's get it out of there and uh, see if we can make something up that will fit. All right, so I've got the shroud out and the fan actually sits on here um, really nicely. Now it's not gonna be centered, it's gonna be offset just because uh, that's where I've got room for it in the engine bay. Obviously, this shroud is not going to work. I'm gonna to have to make a new one. I am going to add uh, these rubber flaps like I have uh, on this one, but I'll add them over uh, the far side so that it takes up that area. And for those who don't understand what these are actually all about, um, a lot of OEMs have these in their fan shrouds. They have some version of this. Usually they're sort of lightweight plastic flaps. And basically what the concept is, is that at low speed, the fan is sealed and it's sucking air from the backside and it'll suck these flaps closed and, and it, makes, uh, it forces the air to come through the radiator uh, and go through the fans. But at high speed, um, a thermofan is actually more of a restriction. It actually... Um, uh, doesn't let as much air through as could flow through normally and that's where these rubber flaps come in is they will actually get blown open by the uh, higher speed air and uh, you can see there's a bunch of holes underneath and that's basic concept is just to uh, let as much air through at high speed as possible and uh, and remove the restriction of the fan so you get the best of both worlds let's get another sheet of aluminium and uh, I'm going to start taking some measurements and see if I can make the same thing again but with the holes in the right spot so start with, I just get some basic measurements and then move over to the guillotine to cut out the basic shape. Now to trim out the corners, I like to drill into the very corner and then cut my little squares out so I can fold it into a box. And this is all about taking your time because once you get a bend in the wrong spot, it's really difficult to uh, change it. Drill out the mounting holes. And I need some clearance in the corners for the radiator pipes. All right, that was pretty straightforward. I just copied the exact same dimensions of the uh, the, the previous shroud I made up and uh, made up a second one. And um, I just laid the fan over the top, marked it out, and uh, now I'm going to, I've just drilled a big hole. I'm gonna use my jigsaw with, a, with just a wood blade. It works really well on aluminum. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna cut that hole out and then we can mount the fan on and then we can start look at doing our flaps. So to mount the fan on, I'm using roof nuts. These are really handy little things for this type of job. Saves trying to get a nut in from the back. Now I mark out my flaps and where the brace is gonna be and then just drill a whole bunch of holes till I fill the space.
give it a quick scuff up and a nice coat of black. All right, so while the paint is drying on the uh, radiator shroud, it's looking good. Let's uh, cut off the bracing and reinstall this and see if everything still lines up the way it's supposed to. All right, moment of truth. Let's uh, start her up, see A, what she sounds like, and then see if I can get up to temperature and see if this fan finally does the job that I need it to do. Oh. That is much quieter. Obviously that's with valves cl uh, closed. Just hit. All right, well that was an eventful test. I think we have our sound sorted. <clears throat> the tone of the exhaust is still not sounding Ferrari-like, but I think that is mostly down to my headers. Just the headers that I've built to this car have changed the sound of it and there's nothing really I can do about that because that is the only headers that will fit. Those of you watching know that this, there's no room anywhere. There's no room for bigger headers at all whatsoever. So that's what we've got. I actually did take it for a little quick, uh, uh, quick drive. The steering is still not sorted. That's something I think I've got some plans for and I'll probably tackle next week. Other thing is the uh, overheating issue. So, um, Initially, it was cooling the car down, but after sitting for a while, same issue as before, it's, uh, it's starting to creep up. It's better with this fan, but still not, uh, not good enough. And um, I thought I'd just go through again, for those who uh, haven't been following along from the start, exactly how the cooling system in this particular car works. So by lowering this plenum, I had to remove the factory water pump. So there is no water pump and there is no thermostat in this car. I'm running the electric water pump, which works as uh, like a thermostat in the fact that when it's cool, it, uh, it just pulses every couple of seconds, just a little bit of the, the, the coolant through so it can uh, warm up the engine. And then as it gets up to temperature, it starts flowing more rapidly to uh, sort of get the, the coolant flowing. There is a restriction in the top radiator hose um, deliberately that came with the water pump to restrict the flow of the coolant because you don't want it flowing too fast. That comes to uh, my radiator in this case. This radiator was custom made in Italy and I gave the specs as as big as I could physically fit. And this is a monster radiator and I believe it may actually be too big. Um, uh, essentially what I think the issue is now is that the water is flowing through it too quickly to actually get cooled down. So I have a plan to fix that. Um, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull the radiator and uh, instead of the coolant running from one side across to the other and then out, it's going to become a triple pass radiator and uh, I'll pull it out now and I'll show you what I'm going to do to try and get the coolant to spend longer in the radiator and I think that hopefully should sort out my issue. All right, so like I said, basically I think my issue with the radiator is that the water is flowing through it so freely and so quickly that it's not actually getting to cool it. And, um, my plan to rectify that is instead of the water coming in here and it just sort of fills up this side tank and goes through the radiator quickly and then comes straight out the other side. It's not spending enough time in the core. So what I actually want to do is I'm going to, I want to actually make the water come into the radiator, but I'm going to put a baffle about a third of the way down on this side so that it can't just go straight down to the bottom of the, uh, the radiator. It has to go through the core and then 
uh, I'll put another baffle about two thirds of the way down on the other side. So, it ha so it'll basically travel through the top third, go down, travel through the, the middle third, and then have to go down and travel through the lower third. So it runs through the radiator three times and actually has, is forced to stay in the core for longer. And uh, I'll see how that uh, rectifies things. Now, to do that, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna cut um, a groove into this side, lay a sheet of aluminum in and then weld it up and basically block off the end tanks and split it into a triple core tanks. So I roughly measure a third and pick a nice spot in between the fins of the radiator on each side, trim through and make enough space for my aluminium plate to fit in. Once I've cut my slots, I clean them up with a wire wheel. And then I start marking my metal plate, just marking the widths first and I cut a couple of notches off so that I can get it to go hard up against the inside of the radiator. Once I've trimmed it to shape, I do the same on the other side. Alright, so I've made my block off plate and you can see that here. Um, it's uh, a nice piece of aluminium that fits in beautifully into this end of the end tank. And uh, basically it's a third of the way down so that the coolant will come in the top here, in, run across the top and then on the opposite side, two thirds of the way down, it has to come down here and it's blocked off two thirds of the way down with another perfectly fitting plate come through and then have to turn around again and then go back through the bottom. So uh, now I'm going to completely flush the tank out again, make sure I get rid of all of the uh, aluminum shavings and stuff like that, anything that's left in there, and then we can start welding it up. I've got the TIG set up. Now that's what I like about having an AC DC TIG is I can weld aluminum. I'm not the greatest welder, but uh, I'm getting better with the practice and being able to switch over to AC, which is what you need for um, aluminium, is a big plus. I've got my weld class TIG set up, ready to go, and I've got everything clean, so let's start welding it up and hopefully leak free. There was a fair bit of contamination uh, in those welds, so they weren't the prettiest welds. Not that I am the greatest welder anyway. So before I put it back in the car, I need to block up all the holes and do a, a pressure test to make sure that there are no holes in my welds. So as you can see, I went through, I blocked up all the holes. I ended up using um, some, uh, some old gauges I had lying around that just seemed to be the right size to bolt up. And I have leaks on both sides. I have two on one side and one on the other. So that is why you check before you put it in the car. So I'm gonna clean this up, re-weld it, and try again. All right, second go, and we have no bubbles. Fingers crossed it sorts out the cooling. So let's fit it back in the car again and give it a go. All right, so the new triple pass radiator is now in and topped up with coolant. So now it's time to start it up get it up to temperature and see if it will actually hold temperature. All right, fans on. Down 
going to turn the fan off. Yeah, buddy. All right, that's the first time I've managed to get the fan to go on and actually brought it down, the temperature down low enough to turn the fan off and, uh, and let it go again. So I'm just going to let it go, cycle through that a couple of times, let it really heat soak and see if it is actually going to cool. Yes! That's twice. I wanted to do it three times through just to make sure. Yeah, buddy. All right, well, that is working. It has cooled down and turned the fan off. I've done it through three times now. Uh, that is fantastic. Um, the beeping is, I still have to sort out my fuel and water temp gauges. They're still not working. Um, but yes, cooling is sorted. All right. Oh, that is amazing. <laughs> the cooling is working. It's cooling the way it's supposed to. The triple pass on the radiator did the trick. Uh, yeah, obviously it was just flowing through the radiator too quickly and just wasn't getting a chance to cool down the coolant. Um, that is fantastic. It's working. It's doing what it's supposed to do. So we've got the noise and we've got the cooling sorted, which are two of the biggest things that were hanging over my head with this build. Um, the last really big thing that's not, uh, that's not up to scratch is the steering, and I will tackle that next time I'm working on the Alpha. But next week, we're back on the truck. Um, in any case, I think that means it's time for Fun Facts with Mrs. Jeff. Hey guys, in 2017, Ferrari released the 812 Superfast. Despite being one of the sillier names Ferrari has chosen, it was actually named after the 500 Superfast of the 1960s. Based on the F12 platform, the 812 increased its 6.3 litre V12 to 6.5 litres, now making 790 horsepower. According to Ferrari, at the time, this was the most powerful naturally aspirated production car engine ever produced. This was made it to a seven-speed dual-clutch transmission, and it shared the rear wheel steering system with the F12 TDF. Despite the huge V12 in the front, the 812 is actually front mid-engined with a 47 in the front, 53 in the rear weight distribution. In 2019, the 812 GTS was released, which was the first front-engined V12 production car offered by Ferrari as a convertible in 50 years. There were also convertible versions of the 550s, the 575s and the 599s, but they were limited and only for special customers. The GTS weighs 75 kilos more than the Superfast due to the chassis reinforcing, but still maintains an equal performance. All right, we finally have the cooling sorted and the noise sorted. So it's now down to the steering and there's a few other little bits and pieces I've been working on off of camera, uh, some little wiring things and uh, there will be a little bit more to go on uh, interior trim bits. There's some kick panels and floor mats and things like that I've still to make. So there's still a little bit more to go on the Alfa Ferrari. And of course it's still not registered yet, so I've still got to do the, the last things, but it's sort of, it's chipping away towards getting to that stage. So uh, yeah. Hopefully you guys will join us on that one. Yeah. Um, also, a, um, yeah, a, yeah, a thank you to uh, Miles Graham, who sent through a British Columbia plate to uh, add to the collection. Um, he's just said that it's off of his truck, Ute, um, that became full race in 2014. So this has been collecting dust. Thank you very much. I'm getting quite a collection here. We've got... Uh, We're very heavy on Canada. We, yeah, we've got, well, we've got British Columbia, we've got Alberta, then we've got Oregon and um, New Hampshire. So that's, uh, that's looking good. Yeah, some Great. international plates is, uh, is, is nice to decorate the workshop. <laughs> okay, like and subscribe if you want to follow Jeff and help him out. He loves reading your comments. And uh, if you want to become a Patreon, help him out even further. Uh, see the videos a day early with no ads. There's an yeah. option available too. And I think that is everything. That's it for this yeah. week. So um, join us on the next one. See you guys. Bye, guys. And it shared the rear steering speed. <laughs> and it shared the real. Rear? The real. Real. The rear was the rear wheel. We just call it the real now. Okay. This was mated to a seven speed manual. No. This was mated to a seven speed dual clutch manual transmission. No. No. In 2019, the 
the do, no what yes 2019 2009 yes in 2019 <laughs> in 29 in 2019 no <laughs> ah! versions of the 550s the five blah, blah, blah.